గురు బ్రహ్మ గురు విష్ణు గురుదేవో మహేశ్వర గురు సాక్షాత్ పరం బ్రహ్మం తస్మై శ్రీ గురువే నమ సదాశివ సమారంభం శంకరాచార్య మధ్యమా అస్మదాచార్య పర్యందా వందే గురు పరంపర సఖనావగతు సఖనవతు సఖవీర్యం కరభాభై తేజస్వినాభీదమస్తమాభిషాహే ఓం శాంతి 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 గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ you can hear me right yeah yeah okay. yes yeah. yes we can okay vastu devendra yogindram natva jnana pratham guru mukshunam idarthaya tatva bodha abhidiyate this is a mangala charanam of tatva bodha the text that we are trying to learn together and we are in the seventh session of this you know that um, we, we go to the temple and we do worship and uh, we do all the aradhanas to swami and we gently lay it as bhakti yoga bhakti marga and by the virtue of in born divinity and the heritage and the satsang when you try to do things to others hitams to others do seva we do karma yoga but then what is jnana yoga the jnana yoga is what we are currently engaged in so you must have the reverence to this because it is as important as reverential as we perform the puja and aradhana or a seva to others because jnana yoga is in very three distinct clear steps one is called shravanam that is understanding the scriptures literally it means hearing the gurus hearing the good teaching it also means that you spend time in assimilating knowledge from the text vedantic text scriptural text mananam is the thinking about the text validating with our own experiential knowledge identifying the doubts trying to resolve it internally or coming back to this shravanam again and then hopefully that that get clarified and then you derive a hypothesis a siddhantam from this and then you assimilate internalize into yourself that is called nididhyas so therefore in the sundays what we do is the yoga yana yoga shravanam and then we do on your own the mananam and nididhyas so in this respect we took this tattva bodha as a prakrana grantha uh, introductory text and if you remember that we used this slide to explain the different sections of it and we finish the first part which is called adhigaratvam adhigaratvam means the essential qualification to engage and rightfully pursue the knowledge of that which will give the supreme goal the chase moksha so the adhigaratvam is the qualification we labor this point in the sex classes because they are very important not only for the vedantic pursuit but also as a human being in any endeavor that we do because it gives you chitta shuddhi dridha buddhi a clarity of mind and a resolute intellect because that is what is needed in all walks of life we identified what they are we enumerated and we will also go through certain practice in when you read the padanjali yoga sutras when you have time so that we can reinforce that so we are going to now park it aside now we have got what we need for this journey we have a resolution to have those tools polished on our own now we move on to the next step okay having got the tools what is that that we are trying to pursue 
that comes into three sections and some of those level says in four seconds i put it for our convenience into three groups the tattva vichara because we think big here nothing trivial that is important it's not a very big thing that we want to talk about so the microcosm and the macrocosm then after discussing that and understanding what they are the purpose of that discussion will culminate into a major equation that there is no difference in everything there are different interpretations by different scholars and different schools of thought that should not inhibit us from studying what we are studying so i study everything and then we try to understand validate this equation that they are all one right and what is the purpose of it and what is the prayojan so we have three sections now that we're going to spend next few sessions to go through this kind of a inquiry so our next focus should be on this part understand the nature of things and we are going to use a vehicle for this because that is the most important part the tattva vichara vichara means inquiry it's a very intense inquiry a divine inquiry mimamsa bujya vichara we don't inquire to just do to to find fault in something you know it's not an investigation to find a mistake it is a search to reveal something revelation is very different from understanding understanding is applying our intellect to create inferences revelation is something which is coming out of that to give you the, the aha moment so that magic now therefore what i'm saying here is that the kind of a giving something to be given to us we need to have the grace of guru the grace of god which is called punya therefore we still have to continue that so therefore do not ever think i had a conversation with somebody last week a great scholar and uh, i think he was he was making a statement that uh, oh, tattva bodha is all elementary text and uh, nothing is elementary every everything is that's the beauty of vedanta everything is complete by itself you don't need to really read something else because you will see in the next chapter is what we see is the essence of vedanta in gita same thing everything is given in one sloka so therefore we take that in in great reverence that we are doing this inquiry so we see very let we finish this um, sadhana chatushtaya samhi and the teacher said etat this is that sadhana chatushtaya sadhana means the abhyasa chatushtaya the fourfold tat tatah that was tattva viveka adhikarino bhavanti by having those four fold qualification the adhikari the empowered person for tattva viveka has arrived so we are all assuming that even though you are jignasa we have practiced and we have the qualification to do this tattva viveka the two things are important here tattva and viveka when we started the first session tattva bodha we talked about tattva we can take it as the truth the supreme truth that we wanted to learn and then subsequently when we talked about viveka we identified there are different types of viveka it's a discriminating intellect karana kari viveka nitya anitya viveka so so on so forth so here we are combining tattva and viveka for our purpose so briefly what is the relationship between these two tattva is the object of the domain of knowledge or the goal or something that we want to understand upon which the vega is to be applied understand so if you are reading physics you have to 
you have to do the uh, subject of the physics and you apply your physical instruments on that subject which is relevant to them. So there is a kind of a correlation between these two terms, Tattva and Viveka. And I want you to be completely with me because I try to go slow, but we are going to be thinking, discussing certain complex subjects, but it's very easy to understand. Therefore, as a first step, we understand the terms a little bit more detail. Tattva and Viveka. As you just now said, Tattva refers to the domain of knowledge that is required for our goal. You can ask, you can use word Tattva in anything. So you are, you are planning a soccer match and uh, you are strategizing it. So the Tattva for the game is to be within the game that you can plan accordingly. So a philosophy is a general term here, but here we are going to focus to our goal. Do you remember the goal? The goal is moksha. So we are therefore singularly focusing to look for the domain of knowledge which is going to help us to reach the goal moksha. We all know as the students of Vedanta, moksha is not dying in this world and then going somewhere. At least from the Advaiti Vedanic perspective, moksha means absolute freedom, total fulfillment. Absolute freedom means it's not that you are uncontrollable, but you are not bound by anything. Ignorance doesn't bind you anymore, karmas don't bind you anymore. See, when, when, when God's incarnate into the world as it's called Abhadhara. Abhadhara is different from Janma. Janma is imposed on us. There's a karma on you. Therefore, you are born to expand the karma. There's no freedom. That's why there may be a, a very scholarly parents and they may have a child who is dumb. Dasharada is, has got many wives and Rama is Ekapatni. Pati. That is an avatara is where there is no binding. So if any existence, any manifestation where there is no binding is absolute freedom. Untouched by anything. And because it is untouched, it is total fulfillment because Attachment gives you desire, desire gives you grief, grief gives you delusion. Remember the famous hero Arjuna, Dvesham, Ragam, Shogam, and Moham. Nothing is there for a person who attained moksha because he is free from any such things. Therefore, total fulfillment. Total fulfillment means it's boundless. Boundless means it is pervading everywhere. Pervading everywhere means time and space cannot contain. If time and space cannot contain, time is mrityuhu. Space is not different from time, it's a different axis. We will discuss that in detail later. Therefore, I become immortal. Therefore, moksha is to be immortal. Fear of death, abhayam. So everybody wants this. That's our goal. Therefore, we can put that status as a supreme chair of existence. I said immortality, therefore, that already removes this doubt about the colloquial use of the word moksha, that somebody is dead, therefore they reach God's divine abode or something. So that's not that, that, that assumption is not here. In very life, you get moksha because you can get fulfilled. That means you must be one with God. You must have the godliness in you. Because Veda says, God is that absolutely free, absolutely fulfilled, absolutely immortal. There is no birth or death. Therefore, in a way, we are a bit cheeky because we are not asking for something very small. We just want to be with God and as God, in God.
and in very moment itself. Therefore, it tells me that the tattva part, the domain of knowledge, should be about God. So the doubt will come because I one may not be a, a believer of God because he has not seen it. Therefore, if uh, I don't believe in God, is there such a supreme state of existence which is completely free, completely fulfilled, forever existing? The doubt will come. So any you can have doubts, but the doubt, if it is eroding the shraddha, you can't continue. And Vedanta is not a subject where you say, Chalta hai, let's just take it for granted. No, you validate everything. You have to have confidence that it is right path. Therefore, we are looking for a subject in which there is some sort of a exper experiential evidence for us. So that it is, yeah, that is possible. Therefore, unless I know the God fully well, I think I know God, but I really don't know God. I try to see no God, I try to see God, I go everywhere. I, I use the very famous statement, everybody is God. I, I know all this thing literally, but it doesn't really resonate in my heart. Therefore, how can I choose? I am in a kind of a wall right now. I've been given a lot of hope to go to this path. I realize the tattva that I should use should be daivatvam, about God, but God to be known. But God is unknowable. The same Pramanam says, you can't know the God. You know, Vedanta says, Brahmavit, Brahmavit Yeki. Brahmavit Apodi Param. One who knows the Brahman becomes Brahman. Some people very wrongly interpret. Therefore, if I read Vedanta, I read the books, somehow I know the Brahman, that I'll know, I become that. Because Veda also says, Vitho Vacha, Nasakshuru, Nasrena. So you can't listen, you can't hear, it's beyond. So therefore, it is unknowable because anything known by any pramanam other than the Shruti Pramana. Even if you say, Vedas also says, Bhagavan in, in trembling hands, Veda says, God may be this way or that way. Imagine this. Even the Vedas are not able to say, this is how God is. You can only say this way or that way. That's why there are a lot of philosophies, lot, lots of schools. It becomes an interesting pursuit. You know, as I was telling you, like, you know, mother plays the child. See what is in my hand. If you just show it off, it is of no interest. It will go and do something naughty. So mother just hides and reveals something and then play around the child. So Parabrahma does the same thing. Come and catch me. It's enticing. But the fact is, it is unknowable. That is said. Therefore, I cannot use purely on God, study all the scriptures, just looking at God, 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 and try to know I may be a good person, but I will not reach my goal. So we need to seek something through the creation of the God. Now, I just warn you now, as I learned very uh, crudely and beautifully that Everything we learn in Vedanta will be very useful step, but once you pass the step, another lesson will come. You know what you learned? Ignore it. Yeah. So here I'm going to use the words like creation, all that stuff. At some stage, you will say there is no creation. So don't 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 say we are contradicting, but this is providing a stepwise knowledge. But we stay with it with me today. So God create everything. I cannot know God, but he created to see things, to enjoy things. Therefore, I should be able to choose any of his creation to be my tattva. You see? So when, 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 when you want to eat the food somebody made, you eat the one bit of it, you know how the food is going to taste. 
great connoisseur can say by eating the food how the food was cooked sometimes i have a sense of you know when i eat the food i know that my wife cooked it with uh, with so devotion because it tastes good you will you will sense it because when you create something besides the tangible gross product yourself is involved which which will 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 contemplate on this so therefore veda suggest okay my child you cannot understand god directly look at god's creation choose that so therefore we need something that which is good enough for us to be tatva but we want something which is almost as good as the god in terms of this loose definition we have absolutely free totally fulfilled immortal beyond beyond everything else is there anything like that in god's creation i can see i can see everything but everything got a blemish whether it is blemish is in that or not i had almost i put the blemish on it even the you know, the love of your child or your wife and mother and father also if any problem is it not nothing is permanent everything dies nothing is free everybody got something some commitment some binding therefore in all this innumerable creation of god which one represent more of god in an limited way that i can choose it for me that one that which is that i'm sure there is you know it i know it everybody know it everybody knows it so that is what we are going to be considering in the tatva part of it you think in your mind right now what that could be as we progress to the next part of it so that we know is what we need to analyze because that is what is going to guide me to understand the goal that is my tatva and what do i do with this i apply the viveka you know viveka means discrimination to split to analyze tagutarive in tamil to reach the goal how how is it done discrimination is done because i think the best way to exa- example is that you have a um, yeah a pile of rice and then there is a pile of grain is uh, or some of the maybe uh, um, wheat is mixed with this yeah so mom asked you to say hey this this one has got rice and wheat mixed i want only rice can you remove this you can do two things you can pick up each rice or you can pick up and we each wheat and throw it away is it not either you take the rice because rice is what is wanted but then if you look at it the rice is like uh, 20 kilograms of rice and look at the wheat it may be just uh, 500 grams if you are smart you don't pick the rice you pick the wheat because that wheat is not something that you want therefore the tatva that you need to know is that this is my tatva it's a mixed bowl i want to remove things that are not important for my tatva so discrimination the viveka is removing which is mixed which is confusingly giving me a wrong inferences and therefore whatever the tatva i chose i need to remove which is not that tatva it sounds confusing the reason i say this this way because if the tatva is there completely if the rice is there completely clean 
your mom is not going to ask you to discriminate on that price. It is already mixed. Because Taxi Vika, it says, that means child, sorry, you cannot just straight away get into understanding this because you are a mixed ball. You just do not know what you need to look at it. Therefore, first you do is to remove, which is not, that needs to be understood. What is that? Discriminate what is from what is not. What is the tattwa that I'm looking for and what is not. So what is the tattwa I'm looking for? I'll give an example, looking, looking for existence. We put many, many things, existence, fulfillment, existence, example. Sad, not asset. So in the God's creation, the tattwa I'm going to choose, the most free one, which I don't need to pay anything, which always exists with me, close to me, is myself. Because I am God's creative being, you are. Therefore, your object, your tattwa, your object of knowledge to be analyzed, is yourself. But do I then reflect godliness? That is not very clear. Assume that it is, we will prove why it is. Now here it tells me that I am a mixed bone. You remember we, we did a couple of classes, Asadoma, Sadgamaya. That's the reason why we made this prayer. I am a mixed bone of Sad and Asad. Let me remove my Asad. Filtering is there. So now we have understood the phrase Tattva Viveka means. Tattva is, I am going to now analyze myself. This is the microcosm you're talking about. Instead of analyzing the God, you are analyzing the God's creation. The God's creation in two parts, myself and everything other than me. I choose myself first because that seems to be easier. And by the way, nobody ever told me in my, all my education, from all my schools, graduation, post-graduation, business schools, nobody told me, analyze who you are. Therefore, maybe something interesting. So I took that as an Atma Vichara. So Tattva Viveka now moves to Atma Vichara. New words, Atma, let's see what it is. So, the student is asking, Tattva Viveka Kaha. Atma Satyam Tad Anyat Sharvam Mithyati. The student is asking because he is a, in this text, what is happening? Every text, every sentence, every sentence the teacher finishes, the bright student takes the last part of it and tags into a question. He finishes with Tattva Viveka. Now he's asking, what is Tattva Viveka? We already know what Tattva Viveka is. Therefore, the teacher is not giving the meta value of the definition, but it gives you the actual answer. He says, Atma Satyam. Atma is that which is eternal. Tad Anyat, other than that, Sarvam, everything else, Mithya, mithya Iti. Mithya means Another new word. So we have here Atma, Satyam, Mithya. The three words have come. In Vedanta, we always learn each word. So we need to learn these words first to understand the Vakyat. So Padartam is first important. That's the time. So we must understand what is Atma. So Please capture, capture this in mind. So we're going to go, give a definition, a simple definition first. There are a few words which you're going to use. Atma, Jiva, Jagat, 
Brahmam, and things like that. Uh, within these half a dozen words, the whole philosophy can be learned. But don't jump the definition, just take step at a time. Sometimes it's called Atman, or Atma, it doesn't matter. Um, so what is Atma? Now because the Guru has told Atma Satyam, he is giving an indication that your Tattva be now on Atma. Therefore, Atma is the object of knowledge that has to be discriminated. So my answer to my previous slide is now very clear. Tattva that I need to analyze is not that God which I think unknowable, but Atma. I do not know what is Atma, but it looks like it is a close representation of the Ishvara, the God. Therefore, that's good. But what is Atma? So the first definition, we can say, a literal definition, is what is referred by the term I in English. It's, it's, I would say I, Raja, Aham, Raja. You will say your name. Or in, in Tamil, say Nam. Hum in Gujarati or whatever it is. In, 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 in each language you have this proper word for it. And by the way, this is the most used word in your vocabulary. Without you knowing it, you use it. Sometimes it, it doesn't even come to the first person because the language helps you, unlike English, like uh, in, in, in many in a, uh, languages. Uh, when you say Padami, Vadami, means you know, Aham is already implied. So Naam, Aham, Ham is Atma. Therefore, the Tattu Vicharam is going to be, so when I say I, you say it to yourself, you. So we are all in together, we are learning together. So whenever I say I, between your heart, you say I to yourself. So Atma Vicharam is about understanding myself. It's a small doubt. So by studying myself, I know how bad I am. You may not know me. I may look good outside. I am such an evil person. In all my act, act in my life, I have not done many good things. By some fortune, I am in this class. I am learning this. But I am asked to study myself to reach God. Am I? The self is appropriate to the goal. So we need to resolve this doubt. Otherwise, you will not have the confidence shut down to take it forward. So therefore, we need to take this to compare with the God. So we, we put another definition here, the definition of Brahman. It's a diff different word for God. The word, the, the root bra is to expand limitless big, ever increasing, so on and so forth. So the word Brahman is used in Vedanta. Sometimes they use Brahman in a, uh, in a masculine gender, but Brahman is, is better, gender free. So because we are using Atma, the self, to be the Tattva, so how does it correlate to Brahman? Because just to remind you, you, know, you can you can put in your mind if you are your Ishta Devada is uh, 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 Shiva or Vishnu, uh, Shakti, Ganesha, Surya, whatever you can you can think in a word. Brahma is Narayana, doesn't matter. But that is one supreme existence, eternal, unchanging, independent. By the way, I know. There are some of the very learned friends in the in the satsang, and some also express the views that uh, not all that that we discuss uh, gels very well with some of the schools of thought. Uh, how the Vasishta um, Vaidhambe Ramarja has said, how Madhu has done, Madhuacha has done. Don't worry about that, because those great scholars 
I will explain that when it comes to appropriate time, they have done a great sacrifice of projecting themselves, putting themselves in a stage where they create an impression that they are opposing other views. For example, in this case, Shankara being the earliest than Ramanu or Madhva, as if they are opposing Shankara's view to give you a different view. But it is because of the compassion, because you will understand as you progress, the Advaita Anabhuti is something which is in a different reality in Paramarthika Satya. It is the truth. But it is like understanding the standing on the knife edge and understanding the knife edge by holding a knife edge. And it was times when people do not understand very well, they started eroding the responsibilities. We live in a world of duality. Duality means, people misunderstand, duality means more than one. No, only two. Only two. This is plurality. There is God and there is something else. That's duality. Purusha and Prakriti. And different shades of it. But if you take it as I am different from anything else, I don't need Vedas to come and tell me. I don't need that. From day one, I know my mother taught feeding me, she me, hello, how are you? And she, she's, she's, she's cuddling me. I know that there is some person cuddling me. The difference is coming to me. I don't need any literature to tell me that everything is different. It is very clear. But why then the duality has been articulated very vehemently, not to have any other job to do. No, because there is a need to explain, they understand the importance of differences to appreciate the unity beyond the differences. Okay, I'm just digressing, but I'll come back to that when appropriate. So I just want to keep your mind at rest. Just, there's nothing that is contentious to your learning is going to come from here. So the Brahman, one supreme existence, eternal, unchanging one, this is something nobody can say why, how, not even Vedas, no Acharyas, nobody can say. But there was a divine will to reveal its path, such as to create all. That's why it's called a divine sport, Leela. Why should God create all this stuff? No, we don't know. We don't know. And that answer, that question can never be answered. There is no point in asking this question. Like something like, how far, how long I have been ignorant of it? Ignorance is anadi. You will never know it. But you know how to end it. If by knowledge I can kill the ignorance. Therefore, we don't worry about certain questions which cannot be answered, but we look for answers which will end all questioning. So when, when the Brahman reveals its power, Vedas, just for us to understand, to find a way to go through this um, complexity of thoughts, it says, there is an Ishvara, again, you can associate Ishvara to Narayana, Parameshwara, Krishna, Rama, whatever you want to call it. And the power of Ishvara. The divine power is revealing itself. There is no differences in any Vedantic school up to here. This divine Ishvara I'm, I'm totally indebted. I do anega namaskarams to Periva Mahapriva of Kanchi, and whose words, for a very little what I understood from there, I'm saying it now. The Ishvara is infinity. 
which is infinitely all at me. Something which you cannot describe. It's beyond everything. Whatever you say, beyond that. So no question on this. It is also independent. Swatantra. Nothing caused it. Therefore, it is always there. That's infinity. That's Ishwara. That's Brahma. That's Ishwara. We split it because we wanted to see the power that's coming out of it, like the heat coming out of the radiator. There's a heat there and there's a fire there. It's same, but it is a power that comes out of it. The heatness of the of the fire is power of Ishwara. But this is where Vedanta makes a statement, which has to be understood very clearly. This power is immense, infinite. Because it's Ishura's power. But it assigns a puja. Here we can take it as nothingness or purnam, everything else. Only for this view, on the basis of its existence. If Ishura is independent, and if anybody, for whatever reason, tried to take the power of Ishura different from Ishura, we are doing that. And we are doing that because Veda asks us to do this for our own understanding. It's not that it, they exist differently. But if we do do that, we must understand the power is immense, but it is not Svatantra. It's Paratantra. It is depending on the Ishvara. Therefore, if I use the locative weight for it, Ishvara is one, power of Ishvara is zero. Are you with me? Take your time to understand this one. So we are only doing for a very simple purpose to assimilate an understanding of the creation. The creation comes out of the power and therefore in our natural tendency, power of what? That question you ask, and Veda allows us to think this way. Therefore, we take Ishvara, the omnipotent, omniscient um, Ishvara is independent. In his, there's the power. The power is therefore zero. If you multiply this together, infinity times zero is not zero, it's not infinity, it could be anything. It's indescribable. Innumerable. This is not. Anything is possible. When the when the Brahman, the Ishvara wants to express his power, her power, or its power, anything is possible. Why I'm driving this? Because we chose, because we don't understand Ishvara, Brahman. You want to choose one of his creations, one of her creations, or one of its creations. So the creations come from the exhibit of power. The power zero with Ishvara, the infinite, the creation becomes innumerable, indescribable, anything. That means you can even learn from a stone. But our self-interest because I don't want to learn something other than myself because I have not learned about myself. Therefore, I am part of this creation. To understand this, infinity is, if anything, divided by zero is infinity. If you put in the equation, n over zero is infinity, the n can be any number. Therefore, God can just create one, create two, create 200, 2.6.5 million, trillion. And can be anything. Now, we, we worship the power of God as Parashakti, Adi Narayani in Vaishnava. All powerful, all prosperous. Therefore, I cannot think, even for example, I can't assign a value zero to it. My, my heart full of emotions and bhakti don't agree to it. That's fine. You're not denying that. It's infinite power. But we are using it here to explain a yeah, difficult knot. 
therefore, the Parashakti, which Bhagavan Shankara worship as Mukampika, Kanchita Makshi, and, and, and in so many forms and so many slogas, and Ishra as um, Mahavishnu, Shiva, Krishna, I worship so many forms, also uses the term Maya. So when say Maya, so what happened was, it's not that I know it there, but what I learned from this is that it, it took a bad reference that Maya means illusion. So there's a Maya Vadis, they talk about everything's illusion. Anything multiplied with zero could be zero, therefore not, the world is illusion. And there was kind of an argument came, and this is what really created problems in for 500 years more than that so dharma was going down like you know buddha's buddhism is not there when buddha was there as you know christianity was not there when jesus was there it is on his name the christianity came in same way buddhism came after buddha buddha was sitting there meditating and his disciple go and ask him questions and he understood everything he was not answering anything so these four disciples took their own mind and written down certain principles and becomes the Buddhism. Same way Shankara's principles have taken out and it has gone into different directions. Then they say, look, you haven't even understood. You can't even understand what is the macrocosm. What is the macrocosm? Understand the duality. Then you understand your Vasishta Advaita. Because this is an important tool. The Advaita Anuputi will happen to you by the grace of God. But because we are studying Advaita um, Shastram here, as this is the Advaita Prakrana Kantam, we use the power of Ishwara as a Maya. Don't ask me what is Maya. When Vivekananda was sitting, he's, he's one of his, uh, Manmata Ganguly, he's one of his disciples in London when he was giving lecture. Uh, he goes and speaks to him and Vivekananda tells him, Gangali asked me what do you want to know. I said, uh, Swami, tell me about Maya. And um, Vivekananda says, okay, ask me something else. <laughs> yeah. Then he goes on to say something, but what I'm saying is, there's a phrase used called, and he'll watch me. That's something which cannot be described. There are great Mahans written about criticizing Shankara for this. Um, Shankara is not here to defend himself, but there are others defended him. But for example, what is this multiplication result? Infinite times zero. Science cannot define it. And it's a chinya. If you take a zero rule, it is zero. If you take an infinite rule, it is infinite. And if you put an algebraic equation, it could be any number. So there are many things that you cannot define and therefore the best way to define them is undefinable. Like when you say Brahman is Nirgunam, that means it is attributeless. And Ramana says attributelessness is an attribute. Yes, of course. If you if you take a Nyaya Vada, yes, it is. But let us not digress into the debates, but understand the potent. Therefore, because it is multiplied of Ishwara Shakti with the Ishwaras and the own Shakti, every creation should have, at least our, our, our uh, physical world point of view, some representation of Ishwara into that. Therefore, if you take any creation, there will be some uh, Ishwara ness, we can say that one, godliness will be there in it, is it not? Therefore, we are guaranteed, we are allowed to use any creation of Ishwara Shakti, Ishwara Maya Shakti in this world. I am a product of it. Therefore, I can be the subject of this study. The other angle to Tattvam, the word Tat in that, is that. In Sanskrit, there are two words, very important words, Vedanta, Tat and Idam. Tat is that which is hidden. In, in, in it comes as, no, that is always hidden. It's three fourths is inside in Purusha Everything comes out of it. The tree comes out of the 
or the, or the, or the seed, seed is hidden, hat is a bijam, idam is a tree. In Lalita Sarashanamam, Ambar is called Vimarsha Rupini. Ambar is the power, Shakti. When Shivam is, or, 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 or the Bharabrimam is not doing anything, it is just Akarta, Bhakta, without having the will. There's, there's not, there is Purnam, nothing to say, there's no duality. But for whatever reason, the divine Icha Shakti comes into, into the Brahman's mind, Aham, the Brahman thought, Nam, I, like you and I think, the Brahman thought, I. The moment the I thought comes, you come, it comes, it comes. The Ambal came as Idam. So, Vimarsanam means eloquence. Elucidation, explanation. Who explained? Who explained the Brahman? Is Amba Shakti? Because if Shakti does not create everything else, if if, if then that then there's no question of God. So the very definition of God comes in because God chose to have idam. But the idam comes out of the multiplication of maya, zero. Therefore, it may appear, but that is not sat. What is sat is tat. That's why we always say om tat sat. Sat means eternal existence. That is the eternal existence. Om is a, is a pranava mantra. So om tat sat. When you say whatever we do, that is eternal. In that form, we can also take the word that to mean that we are focusing on that is eternal. So what about all the creation of that? It's idam. Idani. Everything that you see. Including the avatars. Rama, Krishna. Why? Because they come and do what is needed and they go away. Uddhava is very worried when Krishna decides to leave this world. Uddhava says, how can I be without you? Don't go. The Uddhava Gita comes after that, which is more profound in certain aspect than the Bhagavad Gita. And he tells Uddhava, everything will go. If it is an appearance, it will go. Can we therefore say, um, Krishna, in the, in the avatar, Krishna was not Satya. In the embodiment, he was not. He was giving something else. But then he showed that Satya. Therefore, I told you that something is mixed. So can we therefore assume our job is to remove the asat from the Satya? This is another mistake a lot of people made in many years, and the four different schools came in. Asat means non-existence, unreal. Sat means existence, real. How can unreal and real can mix together? No way. A horn of a hair. Child of a barren woman. This is all the unreal thing. Never happened. They have no place. They can be used in, in logic. Therefore, real and unreal is not mixed. We are not confused about real and unreal things. Therefore, Tattva Veka, the discrimination is not about removing something unreal. Then what? There is something else which may look like real, not real, which may, which may look like unreal, but not unreal. Now many saw Shankara was deluding, he's weak, he's, his vocabulary is lost, and he's using Anirvachanya. It's not true. Either says that. There exist situations where you cannot define in this Vyavkarika world. In this world of duality, 
that whether that exists or not. Take an example, your dream. In your dream, somehow I had a way, I suppose you, I, I come to a dream as well. So you are dreaming where we, we are together and we are walking somewhere. And I tell you, uh, Dr. G, this is, I am not, this is a dream, this is not here. In the dream, you will not agree. No, we are walking together. What are you talking about? Look, the shop has come. But when you wake up, you will say, I had a dream. And I had Raja with me and we are walking to a shop. Was the real, ex the dream existed or not? It did exist. It was in, it was in your anubhav. See, life is called anubhava dhara. Experience what makes life. So if there is something that can exist and give me an experience of it, I'll give it an existence to it because if that doesn't exist, it doesn't give me an experience of it. Vedanta gives you some examples which we need to use it as mandated as you go, like a snake in a rope. You see a snake in a rope by mistake, we saw that in the first few sessions. Okay, just five more minutes. So, if you get fear of the snake, the fear has come to you as an experience of fear. It may affect your health. Some may even die. It has had an incident in your life. There's an existence is there. But when the light comes in, the snake is not there. It is not existing. So at the moment of your experience, it is existing. At the moment of your knowledge, it is not existing. So we need a word for this. It is not unreal. It is neither real. So idam is like that. So now as a sishya, I understood tattu vega means I need the object of knowledge into which I must discriminate. By articulating and listening to all this, I know that knowledge domain could be about myself, that I am the creation of God and his power, but it is idham. So in this, there may be something which exists, something doesn't exist. And when it is creation of God, the godliness is in me, therefore that should be something eternal. Therefore something that is not eternal, is something which I need to remove. The wheat is that, the rice is the other part. So now I understand. Now I go back to what the teacher said. So here there's a word called Jagan Mithya. So here I say the word Mithya. That's what the, the teacher says. Atma Satyam Tat Anyat. The Atma is that, that Satyam. So there is an Atma is I, I am Satyam. Tadanya, anything other than that, that means Idham Sarvam. Idham Sarvam, Mithya. So he used the word Mithya. So Mithya is the word, therefore used, not an illusion, not unreal, not false, falsity. People use this, all kinds of words. It is that inexplicable position where it gives you an experience of it, but it does not have its own existence. So therefore, how do I remember, how do I know what is Mithya in the Vedantic vocabulary? Mithya is that which exists to give you an experience, but it has no independence existence. We are going to talk about it in, in a great depth later. So now I understand because my goal right now as a student is that am I okay to take myself as a subject of the study? So the Vedanta says, it's in fact Shankara's statement, it's not Vedanta's statement, Shankara says to summarize the whole thing, Brahmam Satyam Jagan Mitya Jeevo Brahmaiva Na Paraha. Brahmam Satyam. No school have any, any question about it. Everybody agreed to this. 
Now, but we said Atma Satyam here. That means there's implicit, there is something is said here. I take the two words, Atma Satyam, Brahma Satyam, mathematical equation, Brahma Satyam equals Atma Satyam. Satyam Satyam common, I cut it out. Therefore, Brahma is Atma, Brahma is Atma. So there's an inference here that Atma is Brahma. But my learning just now is Atma is I. Therefore, there is a disconnect here. But I have a Shraddha. Therefore, the disconnect is because of my inability to understand. I just take it from that. But Jagan Mitya. So anything other than me, I can put into Jagan. Jagat means the world. Is Mitya. I understood Mitya means that which exists to give experience but doesn't have an independent existence. I can very easily say everything is an experience and they don't have independent existence. They come out of something else. That means everything I see is Mitya. Absolutely. There's nothing shame to say the world is Mitya. You're in the height that as if Shankara made a mistake. No. It's not an illusion. It's not false. It's not Unreal, it is Mithya, full stop. No English word can give you that one. Everything is Mithya, not Satyam. If you really, really need to use a word, use a, a temporal reality, which is again not right, but you can use it. So I have no conflict on this too. I have not fully understood, but I understand this, this, this part that I can, I can use it. But then comes the last part, Jivo Brahmaiva Naparaha. You put a new word now. Jiva. I don't know what is Jiva. Brahma, I know. Brahma, I know. Brahma, Eva, Naparaha. There is nothing. They are the same. Nothing else. So, this is now an area of debate to many scholars. But for our search, it is absolutely no, no qualms. What it means is that we need to now understand what is this word Jiva, because I know Atma is me. I know I am mixed bowl. I am going to have a tool to remove the uh, mixture to make it better. So I'm confident I'm going to have something. But there's a new word Jiva. How does the Jiva sit with the Atma? And then there's the last is a, a Maha equation. Jiva, Jivo. How am I going to solve the equation? So I will stop here. I think this is a good day to stop. I'll stop here. So, so we have, we have just took one slogan, but we spent a lot of time. And, and if you have any questions, you send it to me, then we can, we can have a separate discussion. But this is very important to have this baseline very strongly committed to you because as we go further, we're going to go much deeper. So let me stop it there. Oh, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> thank you, Raja. Very nice again. <laughs> so we will conclude with the Upanishad by Natu. Please, Natuji. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Sato Sato Ma Sagamaya Tamaso Ma Joder Gamaya Tamaso Ma Joder Gamaya Mretior Ma Amardangamaya Om Shanti 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 Thank you, Notuji, also. Thank you, thank you. Finishing a grand note.